Hello astrostatisticians, we have spoken about linear problems in the class. So hopefully by this point you have an idea what a linear problem is and how to write it out in matrix form. What I want to talk about now is how to do this derivation. This derivation isn't particularly important. You don't really need to know it in order to actually make use of it. And frankly, you probably won't use the derivation too often in your careers. But I do think it is important to know how it works, where it comes from. And ultimately, it does guide us later on when we talk about regularization. We kind of understand where regularization is coming into play here. So let's go through this derivation. I'm going to start from this slide that I showed in the end of the last class, the one being shown right here. You can see this is kind of where we got to. So we can see the residuals are expressed as the data minus the model, where our model has this kind of matrix form where x is our design matrix as we refer to it as, beta is our coefficient vector. And as we go through, what we are really trying to do here is minimize the, uh, the level of disagreement between the data and the model. And so the level of disagreement is really characterized by the residuals. That's just the difference between yi minus this model. And then Rather than just uh, minimizing the mean of that disagreement, we're actually going to minimize the sum of the squares. The reason why we do this rather than minimizing, say, the mean of the residuals, I think we should have talked about this in class already, but just as a reminder, if you use the mean, that's really just saying that the average disagreement is zero, but there could still be one side that has a huge negative disagreement, and the other side has a huge positive disagreement, and they just average out to zero. But really you want on an individual basis every single one of these to be as small as possible. So really what we want to do is minimize the absolute sum of these. So we could do a sum of the absolute residuals would work. In practice we tend to just write ri squared as another way of doing that. It uh, just kind of makes the algebra a little bit simpler when we use squares, which effectively does the same thing. So the thing that we're trying to minimize is this v term, which equals the sum of the residual squared. In machine parlance, you will sometimes refer to this being referred to as the cost function or loss function. And here, we're just going to call it v for the time being. Now, I'm going to sort of switch this out and move into linear algebra notation. So we can actually re-express this v as the transpose of r dot r. That is really just the same as saying the sum of ri squared. And our objective is to find the choice of beta which minimizes this v term. So if you're trying to find the minimum of a function, you probably know that you can take the derivative with respect to the thing that you're interested in varying, in our case here, beta, setting that to zero and then solving for beta. So here, we're going to take the derivative of v with respect to the beta vector, it is a vector, solving for zero and then giving us whatever that beta hat best solution is. All right, so let's just start a new slide and start off with this v equals r transpose r. And of course, let's just remind ourselves that ri is defined in this way. Now, using that expansion and writing it out again in this linear algebra format, we can express that v, rather than just being r transpose r, is truly y minus x, the design vector, beta, or transpose, multiplied by the same thing again, but not with the transpose. Now, the reason why this is useful is that we can now expand this out. If you look at this carefully, you can see it really just works the same as conventional algebra as you would normally do it. You just take that y transpose term, the first term on the left-hand bracket, multiply it out by the right-hand side, and similarly for the x beta term. Now, that x beta term, one trick we can use is the fact that if we have a, b, all transposed, that's equal to b transpose, a transpose. And this is going to be one of several standard linear algebra identities that I'm going to use throughout this derivation. I'm not going to prove these identities, you can find them in many standard linear algebra textbooks, but we are going to use them here just to help us accomplish this derivation. Now that we have that, we can go through and multiply out all of the brackets, so really expand everything out. Next thing I'm going to do is take a double transpose of this term right here. It's not really obvious at this point why I'm doing this, but it will become clear as we go through. It's going to sort of clean things up, make it more symmetrical for us. But when we do this, it's going to basically reverse the order of these terms inside the brackets, as happened with the AB transpose goes to B transpose, A transpose, it's reversing the order. And on top of that, we get another extra transpose on the outside because this is a double transpose. 
Okay, now let's look a little bit closer at this term. There is actually an interesting property about it. The beta transpose multiplied by this design matrix transpose. If you really look at that, what's happening is that you have a column transpose, which becomes a row, multiplied by column vectors. So that actually just returns a row. So everything in green there is just a row. And then, of course, it's being dot productted with a column, which is the y vector. So we have a row, dot product a column, that's just a scalar. And so if you take the transpose of a scalar, that's going to be equal to the same thing. It doesn't matter. So this equals itself. It equals its own transpose. And we can use that identity. So using that fact, we can exchange it with its own transpose and that simplifies things because now we can just group those two middle terms together and give us two beta transpose x transpose y. So we have this final equation for our v, our cost function, and really all we've done so far is simplify it, rearrange it, but that's not what we're trying to ultimately achieve. Ultimately, we are trying to minimize v with respect to to beta. So let's sort of come back around to that point. I'm going to start on a new slide here, start a, kind of afresh, make everything clean. And I want to point something out to you that the term on the left hand side here, v, is of course just a sum of squares, which means it's a scalar. Okay, so it's just a number. And that means that everything on the right hand side, each one of those groupings, like y, t, y, for example, are also scalars. And that's going to be important because it affects the kinds of vector calculus identities that we're going to use. With that point established, of course, let's just also remind ourselves of ultimately what we're trying to do, which is to minimize v with respect to beta, which another way of saying that is that we're trying to solve the derivative of v with respect to beta equals zero. Now for a scalar, which v is being taken the derivative of by a vector, beta, then actually this nabla v beta is in fact equal to the partial derivative of v with respect to beta all transposed. That seems like kind of a trivial point, but it is sort of relevant to this derivation. You'll see at the very end this will be an important thing to remember. With that said, let's proceed and attempt to take the just direct derivative. At the end we'll do the transpose just to finish it off. So Taking the derivatives, we can immediately get rid of the y t y term that has no dependency on beta, and so it just disappears. Let's now take that term on the left-hand side and try to take the derivative of it. I'm going to use this following identity. I'll actually use this identity twice just to try and not use too many identities, just stick to one here. So really what we're doing here is just saying that the derivative of u transpose v by x, where u, v, and x are all vectors, is really given by this essentially vector calculus version of the product rule. Now this is only applicable when the numerator is a scalar and the denominator is a vector, but this is one of those vector calculus identities that hopefully you've come across before. So using that, let's just sort of replace all the terms that we have here. So the u, as you can see, equals beta by lining up to that first term, and the v is going to be x transpose y. So plugging everything in and going through, hopefully you will see that the term on the left-hand side here, this derivative, it, well, has no dependency on beta at the top, so that's just going to go to zero. That makes things like a lot easier for us, and of course that d beta d beta is just one, so all we're left with is x transpose y all transpose. Let's plug that back into our original equation. Right, so one down, just one more to go, and again, we're going to rely on that same identity. But before we get to that, I'm going to manipulate this just a little bit. In particular, I'm going to sort of note this symmetry in here that you have x beta on the right-hand side, so why not just write x beta transpose on the left? You can use that transpose identity to get away with that. Now, if the denominator here was x beta, this would be a walk in the park. This would be really easy to do the derivative of. Fortunately, it's not quite that simple. We have beta in the bottom, but we can sort of get to where we want to get to by using the chain rule. So let's go ahead and rearrange things using the chain rule. And that gives us a x beta by d beta term on the right-hand side, and then our x beta on the denominator of that first term. Now, if we go ahead and take the derivative of this, we should end up with this. It's not really obvious, just looking at it, that's what you're going to get, but maybe some of you can see it already. 
to just really break this down step by step, because after all, that's what this whole video is about. That term on the right hand side is probably the easiest to do. You can see it's x beta d beta. So that's really just x because x doesn't have any dependency on beta whatsoever. So it's really just x d beta d beta. So we get x. The term on the left is trickier, but we're going to return and use that same identity that we used before. So let's just mark that in blue, come over here and say this is the identity I'm going to use to sort of get to that blue term somehow. We'll see. So again, just you know, using the substitutions, we're going to have u be x beta, and v is also x beta. And so this is what we have when we plug everything into this equation. Lots of x betas all over the place. And of course, all of those dx betas, dx betas just go to 1. And you can see here there's sort of a symmetry in that we have x beta transpose plus x beta transpose. So we're just going to end up with 2 x beta transpose, which is ultimately that term that we wrote down on the right hand side or the first part of the right hand side of that equation. So hopefully that explains now very clearly where that x beta transpose term comes from. Finally, I'm just going to take that transpose term, which is on the outside of that bracket, and just work it through into the inside of the bracket, which means flipping over beta and x around. And now we are ready to actually write down what nabla v is. That's going to involve just taking a simple transpose, but that's a piece of cake. So just doing that, it gets rid of the transpose on the left-hand side by sort of a double cancellation rule. And with a little bit of rearrangement, we get the right-hand side be 2xtx beta. You'll notice that here I've actually exploited the fact that x transpose x or transpose equals x transpose x. In other words, it's kind of equal to its own transpose. And that's just because we have, by construction, created a symmetric matrix here. Okay, so let's take that result over to a fresh new slide, clean the slate, make everything fresh again, and remind ourselves what we're trying to do here. We are trying to take this nabla v equals zero and solve for beta. So let's just do that. It's really a piece of cake now. Just rearranging and setting the left-hand side to zero, we have x transpose y equals this thing on the right hand side. Now if I want to express this as beta hat equals something where beta hat really means the best solution now to be explicit, that's really just taking an inverse. That's all I have to do to get rid of that x transpose x. So let's take the inverse of x transpose x, stick it on the left hand side of both sides of this equation, and then we'll end up with beta hat equals voila, the normal equation. So as we'll, I'm sure, talk about in class, this is very, very powerful equation. It allows one to write down the best choice of parameters analytically. So there's no iteration process here. There's no uncertainty or ambiguity about whether you're in the best solution, the local minimum or local maximum. This is guaranteed to give the best result. But of course, the caveat is that it's only valid for linear models and it's only valid when assuming you're minimizing the least squares. That's sort of your cost function you've implicitly built into this. And so for that reason, because we're minimizing least squares as linear, we often describe this as a linear least squares problem, or sometimes it's called ordinary least squares as well. Okay, that's it for this video. When we come into class, we'll talk about sort of not really an alternative derivation, but maybe an alternative way of thinking about it that might be more straightforward than this. But this is the grueling, dirty details. So if ever you need to refer to how to derive this from first principles, this is the video to refer to.